One point before we move into the 11th chapter, verse 11 of chapter 10, uh, we read at the end of this chapter, of course this chapter 10, we see what I believe is Jesus Christ coming down in, in this mighty form, um, and he, he has one foot on the sea, one foot on the land, and uh, he says there's going to be no more delay. And then John is asked to eat this scroll, this little scroll that Jesus has in his hand. And he is told it will be sweet on your tongue or in your mouth, but it will be bitter in your stomach. And that is exactly what we read John experiencing. And of course, we, we talked about some of the possibilities about, of what that meant that it was going to be great to see God's people avenged, uh, justified, protected, and delivered. But for that to happen, they were going to have to go through very difficult times, uh, continue to go through difficult times, and as well, the Israelite people, the nation and the religion, are going to be forever destroyed in the process. And so what a bitter pill, we would say, to swallow. And... Um, so we see there that John does that. And in verse 11, he is told, and I was told, he says, you must again prophesy, and the King James uses the word before, many peoples, nations, languages, and kings. Um, but uh, that word before gives us the impression that John is going to stand before people of very many different nations. Our, the secular history or church tradition, I should say, says that after John got off the Al Patmos, he goes and does have a ministry at Ephesus and um, works at Ephesus. But the Greek word here translated um, uh, before literally means about. And so I believe what uh, John is being told is you will again prophesy about many peoples and nations and languages and kings. A small variation there, but um, one that I think is uh, noteworthy because John is late in his uh, life here as this book has been written. Okay, so with that, verse uh, chapter 11 in and in chapter 11, here in just a little bit, we're, we're going to see a change take place in the book, in verse 15. In fact, uh, in verse 15, I think we see the stated purpose of the book take place. And so we'll pause there when we get there. But I say that to say that we are in a transitional point of this book of Revelation here in just a moment or two. If you would read with me, um, about the two witnesses in chapter 11, starting in verse 1. Then I was given a measuring rod like a staff, and I was told, rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship there. But do not measure the court outside the temple. Leave that out, for it is given over to the nations that they will trample the holy city for 42 months. And I will grant authority to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1260 days, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. And if anyone would harm them, fire pours from the mouth and consumes their foes. If anyone would harm them, this is how he is doomed to be killed. They have the power to shut the sky and that no rain may fall during the days of their prophesying and the days of their prophesying, excuse me, and they have the power over the waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they desire. We'll pick up there in verse 7 in, in just a few moments. So before we get to the two witnesses, we have the measuring of the what? The temple. And we are going to measure the temple, but we are not going to measure what? Court. The court. It's outside, of the 
the outside, the court of the Gentiles is essentially what we um, are getting at. Literally, as Mike, you said, it's outside the court outside the temple, which would have been the court of the Gentiles. Remember, throughout all the plagues of the first uh, number of seals, there's horrible things taking place. But during that time, remember that it's been emphasized over and over again that there is one sitting on the throne. And he's watching over and even conducting all of this. Who is that? Jesus. Close. Who's, Jesus is involved, but who's sitting on the throne? God. God, God the Father, right? And in fact, he's praised over and over again throughout these early chapters as the creator, the one with power. And so the people are being comforted in the fact that God has not forgotten them. In fact, he is in control. And even though the world seems as though it's in utter chaos, and I believe we would say that today, but as we've looked at the history of this time, it by far was a worse time to live. God is saying, I am in control. But then, remember, after they have cried out to him and sent their prayers up to before him, the, the martyrs have come out from under the throne and cried out to him asking how long. In chapter 7, the people were sealed. What did that seal mean? They were going to be what? Speaking of the 144,000 in chapter 7 that were sealed. What did it mean that they were sealed? Wasn't going to change? Wasn't going to change? Uh, yeah, I mean that that is one of the ideas of seals, right? That you're you're preserving it, right? And if, if you're preserving it, Emily, what, what else are you doing to it? What's another word that you could use? Protecting, right? Um, it, it, am I right with your idea of a seal that you're like you're sealing up canning something? So exactly, you're preserving it, you're protecting it. God is saying, I'm going to protect my people throughout this time. Now, Throughout all of much of the Old Testament history, another way of saying you were going to protect something is to measure it. And so now John is told, I'm going to give you a rod. Go and measure the temple. Now let me ask you, was the temple protected throughout all these things that take place? Well, we read had to be, so, right? Uh, was the physical temple protected? Things shaking her head. No, it's destroyed, right? Emily's right. We're reading about its protection, right? What temple was protected? By this point, and this is one of the main thrusts of the book of Revelation, what is the true temple of God? where he dwells. So at this point when Revelation is written, what's the true temple of God? Where does God dwell? His church. In his church, in his people, right? What we are measuring here in chapter 11 is God's people. We are told, again, they are going to be protected. And that God's in control. That's very important because the re next part of this chapter is dealing with the two witnesses. And the two witnesses are of God, but what happens to them? Well, there's some people harming them. They're going to be killed. We did read that. We, I stopped a little bit before, one verse before. What happens to them by the end of verse 7? They're killed. 
They're killed. Ooh, doesn't sound like they're protected, does it? But God is making this case, and actually he is protecting these two witnesses. Um, the, at this point, the temple that we're measuring is God's people, the church. The outside, the court of Gentiles, is the physical temple as well as the Israelite people. That's the point that God is making. Remember we looked last week that I will make a new Jerusalem and the old will be forgotten and remembered no more? He's making that case that I will protect my people but that old temple is going to be, did you notice? Leave verse 2, but do not measure the court outside the temple. Leave that out, for it is given over to the nations that they will trample the holy city. What's the holy city? Jerusalem. Yes. So he's saying, I'm going to protect that inner temple. But the holy city physical temple in the city of Jerusalem is going to be trampled underfoot by the nations. Questions or comments on that part of it? I don't, don't ask me quite yet about the, the 42 months. We'll, we'll get into that. No? Okay. So, uh, it's going to be trampled underfoot for how long? 42 months. How long is 42 months? Three and a half years, absolutely, Jerry. How long is 1,260 days? If you don't have a calculator with you, it's identical to 42 months. So how long is 42 months? Three and a half years, right? We are going to see this time frame described in a number of of ways. Um, it all comes out to three and a half years. Now, I think there is a representation of what that meant physically, but I think the most important aspect is that it is half of what? Three and a half is half of what? Seven. Seven. And seven is the complete number, right? So there's going to be a time of trampling, but it's not going to be forever. However, how long did the Roman um, campaign against Israel last? Three and a half years. Almost right there. Okay? So the spiritual point, because we're going to see this number come back up, over and over. It's got a greater spiritual indication. Uh, but I believe it is getting at the idea that um, it is alluding to the fact that the Rome, Rome is going to uh, campaign for three and a half years um, before Israel is completely destroyed. So in verse 2, we see it trampled under by, for 42 years. And in verse 3, we see more characters. I, I know why you're grinning now. Not 42 years, Emma. 42 what? Months. Months. I thought, why did Emma's face light up so much? <laughs> She's saying, I'm smarter than Mike. <laughs> I know the difference between a year and a month. <laughs> uh, verse 3, then, we're introduced to two more characters. Boy, there's a <laughs> list of characters in this book, isn't there? Two witnesses. Now, and uh, these two witnesses will prophesy for 1,260 days. Now, their prophecy will be in sackcloth. What does sackcloth mean in, in Old Testament scripture? Warning. Warning, absolutely. So there's a sadness to their, uh, minist to their ministry, to their prophesying. Now, some see this, the two witnesses, as being the church. 
You say, well, how could it be the church if there's two witnesses? There is, and the reason I bring this thought process up is because there's an, there's an important aspect to the two that we need to recognize. For evidence to stand up in Jewish court, there had to be, can you guess how many witnesses? Two. Two. For anything to stand up. The overall point is God is saying, I'm putting forth my witnesses to give evidence that will stand up, that's supportable, that is true. Okay? That's the overall point. So I think there's a chance that this, these two witnesses represent the church. I'm not going to go very far down that road. I, I do acknowledge it's a possibility because I see, I see Revelation and I hesitate to say this because I'm disagreeing with some people who seem to be a lot smarter than I am. Uh, but I see these two witnesses described very well and very accurately in the verses uh, that follow. Now, by the way, chap verse 4 is from Zechariah, the fourth chapter. You want to mic that in your, in your margin, go ahead and do so. I went back and stayed Zechariah 4. And I didn't find it overly helpful other than it does kind of allude to the church. It's, it's a prophecy concerning the church. But I still don't think that leads us to these two witnesses being the church. But there's certainly a connection we'll see in a moment. Verse 5 says, if anyone harms them, there will be a fire that comes out of, their mouth, out of them and consumes them. And that's how you're, they're going to die if they're harmed. That does not mean that they cannot be harmed, right? It means that those who harm them will be harmed in return. Verse 6, they have the power to shut up the sky that no rain may fall during the days of their prophesying. Can anyone think of a prophet who literally was able to do that? Elijah. <laughs> Absolutely. I believe um, I, sometimes I get so many verses written in my margins, I, I, I could give you some um, wrong information. I think 1 Kings 17 might be where that's at, but don't, uh, if that's not it, go elsewhere. Elijah, 1 Corinthians, or excuse me, 1 Kings 17, okay. So when Elijah is prophesying, Remember, he, he caused it not to rain until he asked it to rain again, right? And brought that tremendous drought upon the entire land. That, to me, is defining the witness as Elijah. Why? Elijah stands as representative of what group of people? Jewish people, but we can narrow it beyond that. He represented a group of people within the Jews. The prophets. What is the Old Testament made up of? Jesus described it this way. The blank in the prophets. That's what described. Okay. Good guess. The law and the prophets. It's the entire Old Testament, right? That's how Christ described it. It's how it's described many times. Notice this other witness. And they have the power over waters to turn them to blood. Does anyone remember who did that? Moses. Moses. And who, what did Moses represent? God. He represented God. That's true. The law, though, didn't he? He was a lawgiver. Um, and also to cause every kind of plague as often as they desire. I believe that these two witnesses are the law and the prophets representing the Old Testament church. What they are witnessing about, did I say the church? Excuse me. The law and the prophets representing the Old Testament law. What they were witnessing about was, I believe you could say, either Christ or the church, right? So, there's that connection, I believe, to Zechariah 4 and 
the um, and the uh, the church. Let's read through these next couple verses. Does anyone have any question on those before we further this? Okay, so seven um, and continuing. And when they have finished their testimony, the beast that rises from the bottomless pit will make war on them and conquer them and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city that symbolically is called Sodom and Egypt, where the Lord was crucified for three and a half days. Some from the peoples and tribes and languages and nations will gaze at their bodies and refuse to let them be placed in a tomb. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and make merry and exchange presents because these two prophets had been a torment to those who dwell on the earth. But after the three and a half days, a breath of life from God entered them and they stood up on their feet and great fear fell on those who saw them. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying, come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud and their enemies watched them. At that hour, there was a great earthquake and a tenth of the city fell. 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake and the rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe has passed. Behold, the third woe is soon to come. So in verse 7 is they finished their testimony. That's another phrase here that makes me believe that uh, this is the law and the prophets. Uh, the church did not finish its testimony. Uh, it, but the law and the prophets had. They had been fulfilled. Um, the beast that rises from the bottomless pit. Who's that? Devil. Devil right? Now we, we contrasted the difference between opening the bottomless pit and that which comes out of the bottomless pit. The abyss, that's uh, Satan. And we'll see him throughout the rest of this book. Um, and he will make war on them and conquer them and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street, that great city um, that symbolically uh, Sodom and Egypt. What had Satan been able to accomplish with the Old Testament religion? Judaism. He'd completely corrupted it, had he not? That's part of the case that Christ had made. Furthermore, remember when we studied about the zealots a number of weeks ago? How the zealots start to get the Jews to fight one another? And I'm not sure if I... Um, Shared this with you, but Annas um, says that he, which is a high priest, uh, and Josephus quotes him as saying that he wished he had died rather than to see all the profanity and the corruption taking place in God's people. That's my paraphrase, <laughs> his quote. For one, I don't speak Hebrew and, and I haven't memorized Josephus, so um, bear off paraphrasing. Um, one of the things that had taken place is the zealots were fighting for the temple because the temple was a, the most fortifiable place in the entire city. So murders took place right in the temple. And at one point, I think this is an interesting point, I don't think this is directly what these verses are referring to, but there's a great battle taking place between... Um, that two different groups of zealots and they're fighting at the temple and there's a great earthquake and thousands of people die while they're fighting one another. Let me get back to the, the primary point though. Judaism had become so corrupt and then we saw the, the, the bottomless pit be unleashed and with that, there's rebellion and fight infighting, and it's a horrible thing. And this is supposed to have been God's chosen people. 
Furthermore, they all point to what? The law and the prophets. What were they waiting for? The Messiah. And the Messiah comes and what do they do to him? Kill him. Right? Kill him. So, they have essentially killed God's witnesses in doing this. Uh, eight, their bodies will lie in the street of the great city. I think the fact that it lies in Jerusalem um, is again telling us that they've corrupted and destroyed God's will, the old covenant in this case. Um, and then in nine, they for three and a half days the people and tribes and languages and nations will gaze at their dead bodies and refuse to let them be placed in a tomb. I believe the idea here is utter disrespect. It was unlawful to let a body out overnight by Jewish law. The three and a half days, I believe, again, is half of seven. It's saying this isn't going to last forever. In fact, in the verses to come, we see it doesn't last forever. Um, Ten. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and make merry and exchange presents because the two prophets have been torment to them who dwell in the earth. I think this is one of two things or a combination of the two. Either the Jews are celebratory over their great victory. Right? We even talked it when they, when they defeated the first Roman um, attack on the city they celebrated and were happy and, and joyous and then everything went got so much worse for them on every front possible. The Jews were happy to have crucified Christ to put to death that Old Testament covenant because they thought they'd retain power. As well the Romans when they destroy Jerusalem are, they think it's wonderful, right? In fact, it's the greatest loot ever recovered. The, the Arch of Titus still records, by the way, it's the most accurate record, visual recording of God's um, furniture from the temple because it pictures the Romans carrying all the sacred furniture back to Rome. They, they thought it was wonderful because it so well but so they got so much wealth from it, but it plummets the world into a depression afterwards. For one, gold prices plummet. Uh, and, and so many things economically fall apart after this. Um, so there's a great victory. I believe it's primarily the Jews um, rejoicing over it, but after three and a half days, a breath of life from God entered them. The, the idea here of breath, I think, is not just like an animal lives, but, but the breath that God puts in Adam, right? Puts in you and I, brings them back to life. They raise up, God says, come up here, and all their enemies see them send into heaven. How did that happen? <laughs> <Linda says>, <laughs> Yeah. Did you say vacuum? Yeah. <laughs> I like the way your mind works. I hadn't seen that before, but I see it now. <laughs> like that, those lottery balls, huh? <laughs> You're the one. <laughs> I believe this is the church continuing to reign. Who's behind all this? Don't forget, we've talked about the physical forces, but who's behind this? God's in control, verse 7. Who's behind this? The beast that comes out of the bottomless pit. Satan is behind it. He thinks he's won. In fact, chapter 12 is going to get into that very idea, I believe. Where we have this wonderful woman giving birth to a male child. Satan's there to, to attack it and things don't go the way he intends them to go. The church, Satan could not destroy. In fact, 
And this is going to be built upon again in chapter 12. It's moved away from Satan's influence. He could attack the physical kingdom. But when it becomes a spiritual kingdom, it's now outside of Satan's direct influence. It's above him, if you will. He can have attack individuals, right? but he can't bring other nations and attack. <coughs> Emily? Why would he send these people to heaven? Why would God bring no, the... No, you said it was the devil. Oh, I'm talking about having them killed. I was in verse 7. Great question. Um, and when they have, verse 7, and when they have finished their testimony, the beast that rises from the bottomless pit will make war on them and conquer them and kill them. That's what I was referring to. But he's not the one that sent them to heaven. No. This is God then. Um, verse 12, then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying, come up here. And, and he sends. I see that. So, great question. Clarify. There's so many characters. It's it's great to to keep those clarified. Okay. This is um, oh a tenth in verse um, thirteen. A tenth of the city fell, and seven thousand people were killed in the earthquake. I do not believe those numbers are literal. We see one-tenth as being a unit, right? Um, and 7,000 to be a lot of people is what, um, in, in this earthquake. That's how many were killed in the earthquake. I think the spiritual idea being conveyed is through the, remember we talked about earthquakes destabilizing? In the de dis, um, stability, instability, it results in it, a great number of people lose their life. Now with that then, the second woe is past. Don't forget, we're still opening these seals. That was the completion of the sixth seal. And there's still one more woe. There were three woes, these last three seals. The angel, eagle flying over says, woe, woe, woe. This is the second woe. And we are going to see the third and final woe to come. Now, I'll introduce this, and then I want to talk about, um, in the couple of minutes that we have left, um, what, what we are going to see here at Seventh Seal. Uh, verse 15, then the seventh angel blew his trumpet. Uh, I'm sorry, the, the seventh trumpet. And there were loud voices in heaven saying, notice the difference. Most of these, the trumpets have sounded and there's been calamities. At one there was silence, but now there's rejoicing. Notice why we're rejo there's rejoicing. The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. In my deeper studies, if, as I've come through this with you, I, it, many scholars point out that in verse 1, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Most say, scholars say, that means the unveiling of Jesus Christ. Until recently, I've rejected that idea and seen it more as Jesus is giving a revelation the revelation of Jesus Christ. But literally, many maintain that it means the unveiling or the revealing of Jesus Christ. At this point, I think we see a strong aspect of this. And this fits for the first time in my mind through the entire book. Jesus came to earth how? Humbly, as a servant. Right? It's kind of like God incognito, isn't it? It would be easy, especially in face of all the persecution in this incredibly strong Roman Empire, to think of Christ as weak. 
That's not the Jesus Christ we see revealed in the book of Revelation. In fact, in the first chapter, he's this mighty being. And he immediately says to each of the seven churches, get your things in order, I demand it. Right? And now we see him being the one worthy and bringing about these devastating powers on all of his enemies. I believe that this point in 12 is the stated purpose of the book. The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. He shall reign forever and ever. Thank you for your time. Lord willing, we'll pick up.